An integral part of any x64 instruction are the parameters we encode into them. So before we can build any assembly level abstractions, we'll need to create an approach for encoding these operands. There are three different types of input a machine code instruction can receive. Immediate values, register references, and memory locations. Let's tackle them in order of complexity, starting with immediate values. In one of my very first videos, I described integers as the most fundamental type of data. In the video, we built some basic nodes that receive number strings and return the corresponding binary hex codes. Those bytes are associated with specific integer types, which currently aren't compatible with our framework for building machine code instructions. To make these pieces fit together, we'll need an intermediary node for transforming our integer types into immediate values. For now, we'll only be dealing with 32 and 64-bit values, so the node should simply accept integers of either size and return the same data with the desired type. I want to keep this as simple as possible right now, but we will definitely return to this node in the future to implement features like compile time padding of smaller input data. Inside the node space, let's start by defining a selection socket with two options, 32 and 64 bits. We will then activate different value inputs based on that selected option. If a 32-bit immediate is desired, the value input will allow signed and unsigned integers of the same size. However, if a 64-bit immediate is requested, only the 64-bit integer variants will be able to connect to the socket. We then simply gather the input value from the type node pairs using this new collect node. Finally, all we need to do is provide the data to an output port with the corresponding output type based on our selection value. So, 32-bit immediate for the 32-bit integer data and 64-bit immediate for the 64-bit data. Let's waste no time and move on to our register node implementation. At the end of the day, all this node really does is map different select options to 3-bit values. You might expect the 64-bit registers to result in 4-bit values as per the documentation. However, I have opted to encode this additional bit in the output type itself. Since the additional bit for identifying 64-bit registers is stored separately in the rex prefix, any receiving nodes would need to split off that bit to encode the correct machine instruction. Such nodes would need to detect whether or not a rex prefix is needed based on the input data type anyway. So by encoding the rex prefix bit in the register subtype, we make the resulting node graphs a little simpler. Right now, the output types for RAX to RDI is 64-bit register, and for R8 to R15, it's 64-bit new register, for lack of a better name. I couldn't find any proper naming convention for the additional X64 registers online, so feel free to propose a different name for this subset in the comments below. But let's get into the actual node implementation. We start off with another select socket that allows us to choose between 32-bit and 64-bit general purpose registers. Based on the selected option, another select socket is activated which provides all the corresponding register names. So for 32 bits, we get EAX, ECX, and so on. And for 64 bits, we get everything from RAX to R15. These options are then mapped to their binary values and collected into three distinct groups. Each of these register groups is then channeled into a separate output socket with the corresponding register type. As mentioned earlier, the first eight 64-bit options are mapped to the standard 64-bit register type, and the other eight options are mapped to the 64-bit new register type. I'm really not a fan of that type name, so please really do feel free to recommend other names in the comments. By far, the most complex machine level type is the memory address. This is mostly due to the fact that it can be encoded in a variety of ways. Luckily, almost all bits used for encoding a memory location are next to each other in the final instruction byte sequence. 
It always starts with the RM field in the mod RM byte we discussed in a previous video. Here we point to a register that contains some base location we want to use as our memory address. The value of the register can either be used as is or in conjunction with a displacement value, which is either an 8 or 32-bit signed integer. If specific registers are referenced in the RM field, the so-called SIP byte is expected in the encoding. We discussed the SIP byte a little in a previous video, but what it basically does is perform a specific calculation using two registers and a scaling factor. The SIP byte is always encoded directly after mod RM, making our final memory address data a combination of RM bits, SIP byte, and one or four displacement bytes, where the last two components are optional. The final piece of this puzzle is the mod RM mode. If these two bits are set to a value of three, then the RM bits are not interpreted as a memory location. In every other case, a memory location is determined. Our memory address node should therefore output three different types, from which an instruction can then infer the correct mod RM mode. So to recap, the basic idea is to combine all necessary bytes defining a memory address into a single string instead of dealing with correct SIP encoding in each instruction node separately. This memory address node will somewhat act as a wrapper for the already implemented SIP node. We basically just need to build the node network equivalent of this mod RM addressing table. We'll start the node implementation by defining a socket for the aforementioned RM register. We'll allow all three of the new register types we defined earlier, convert their binary string data into the corresponding decimal number, and then sum up these values using a math node. Since only one of these type nodes can ever be activated at any point in time, this effectively just converts the input register value into a decimal number. If we take a closer look at the mod RM addressing table, we can see that we need to determine two conditions based on the register number. If the encoding has a value of 4, a SIP byte needs to be encoded. If it has a value of 5 and the mod RM mode is 0, we need to enable 32-bit displacement. We can determine these truth values using two condition nodes. Before we continue, let's briefly define a select socket for specifying the mod RM mode itself. Each option directly corresponds to an output type name, which we can collect from connected value nodes and then provide to the output type node. But that of course isn't the only purpose of this input. We also need to use the truth values provided by the mode options to activate the correct displacements. Let's first define two displacement sockets, one for 8-bit signed integers and one for their 32-bit variant. The 32-bit displacement socket will be active if the mode is 2 or if the RM value is 5 and the mode is 0. The the 8-bit displacement will only be active if the mode is 1. As usual, the received displacement bytes from either port are then collected for combination with everything else in the end. All that's left to do now is to find three additional ports which are only active if the RM value is 4. The first is a simple number between 0 and 3, representing the SIB scale. The other two ports are for receiving the SIB index and SIB base register references. These inputs are then provided to our pre-existing SIB byte constructor node. We then simply combine the RM bits with the SIB byte and the displacement bytes to form our final memory address encoding. As I've already mentioned, this data is provided to a single output port using a data type based on the input mode. Now that these machine level data types have been properly implemented, I'll have to go back to our instruction encoding framework and adjust some details. However, those changes are not big enough to warrant an entire separate video. I just wanted to mention it here since viewers of the initial instruction encoding video may be confused about how these nodes can connect if the type strings don't match. These low level implementations and the compiler itself are still very much work in progress, so there will be some discrepancies between dev logs in these early stages. With proper operand encoding completed, we can now actually tackle the move instruction as planned. 